audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. The story. My heart was restored miraculously, eventually to just normal, but my kidney function stayed just outside of normal. So I was left with a thorn in my side. There's consequences for the choices we make. And these days I've actually been doing 10 years of drug and alcohol awareness education, and it's not missed by the students. The fact that I've been left with consequences. G'day, I'm Jimmy Colfax. Welcome to The Story. Well, last time, Karen Redpath began sharing her story of coming out of the darkness of drug addiction. We ended up at her lowest point when she was severely ill in hospital and was told she had less than two hours to live. But also, we heard how God miraculously touched her and the doctor said it was as if she had a new heart. Well, today we'll hear more of her story and the role her brother played in her becoming a Christian. Once again, she's chatting with Eric Scadabo from her home in Melbourne. Tell us about the role your brother played in leading you out of the darkness and into the light. Oh, look, I just, you know, have eternal gratitude for my my brother and his faith and so forth. Um, His pastor actually came to visit me in hospital several times. He was a Baptist minister. Um, Mm. He's retired now, I believe. Uh, Brian McKelvey, I need to mention him. He's so wonderful. And he used to pray with me in hospital. And I, I was so out of touch with God that it was like, I hope nobody sees this, you know. (laughs) But after I came out of hospital, um, I I was, well, actually, sorry, while I was in hospital, I began to ask the doctors. I was 25 and I'd never had any children. And I began to ask the doctors if I would ever be able to have children. And and their answer was, was, well, Karen, you know, with the damage to your, your kidneys, your arterial system, the blood pressure, you know, you probably wouldn't survive a pregnancy and mm. you, neither would a baby. And I was absolutely devastated. Like this wasn't the plan. I'd always thought one day I'd meet someone, settle down, have a family, and to make it worse, I'd cause this myself. So when I finally got out of hospital after almost five months, I moved back in with my boyfriend and... Um, you know, I wasn't a Christian and, you know, I didn't, my doctors had warned me not to try a pregnancy, but, you know, I was desperate to be a mum. I just, mm. it was an instinct that God had put in me and yeah. I went against their wishes. I lost a couple of babies, which was absolutely devastating, no, never mm-hmm. knowing if I would become a mum. But finally I did. I had a pregnancy. I actually have found, got the notes that told me not to go ahead with the pregnancy, but I decided to take the risk and Sure enough, um, 13 weeks early, at 27 weeks, I went into premature labour and I was put into hospital for seven weeks in the um, Queen Victoria Medical Centre, which is no longer there either. (laughs) And there was a lot of people in there with drug issues. I was no longer on drugs, but there because of them and on other medication. And six weeks early, sure enough, my kidneys went into failure and I had an emergency caesarean. It was a little bit touch and go, but both my son and I survived Mm. amazingly. And when he was a year old... um, By this time, my my brother's Baptist minister had been inviting me to this wacky thing called a miracle meeting that was held Mm. at the Dandenong, in a room at the Dandenong Town Hall. And Mm. when my son was um, 13 months old, actually, I I really felt incomplete with only one child. And I thought, maybe there's a God, maybe he can help. I won't become a Christian or anything, but, you know, I'll I'll go along and check out this prayer Mm. thing. And just so happened they met that day. They only met once a month. And so Brian took me along to this meeting and a pastor named Nancy Harkins stood up and shared how she had had heart and kidney failure Mm -hmm. and God had healed her. Not just kidney, not just heart, heart and kidney failure like I'd had, (laughs) not caused by drugs but a different cause. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Like I felt like someone was pointing straight at me. Mm. And I went up the front at the end of the the message and and I um, I, I just, she she, stood in a prayer line and, and she came along and I just poured out all of my issues to her and she began to pray for me. And as she laid her hand on my head and prayed for me, I just felt this amazing touch, like just love, just wash mm. through my body. Yeah. And, and it was God. And I just yeah. burst into tears and I just wept and I wept. And that was the day that I chose to follow Jesus. I chose mm-hmm. Jesus to be my Lord and Saviour. That was the 17th of July, 1985. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I went down the back and had a bit of, um, you know, someone counseled me a little and it was just incredible the way God lined things up for me. And 
over the next few weeks, I'd had no, by this point, my kidney function had been uh, 40% and it hadn't improved and I'd had no improvement for three years. Over the next few weeks, my kidney function began to improve and improve. Mm. And um, I've now been blessed with two more children. Uh, mm. So I've got Kyle, Stefan and Phoebe, and they're all grown up and wonderful young adults. And, wow. you know, just I just feel like I'm the most blessed mum on the planet, yeah. And with the t- second two pregnancies, I had no kidney failure. Oh, okay. My kidneys were not 100%, so they delivered them a little bit early, but I didn't go into kidney failure. So, But, yeah, it was. I went from six weeks early to four weeks early to three weeks early. So it got better rather than worse, which is what you'd imagine yeah. with damaged kidneys. So, so I just want to go back to uh, what the doctor said when you were miraculously yep. healed. They said, it's like yep. you have a new heart. But then, of yeah. course, spiritually, we know when you accepted Jesus as your Savior, you were given a new heart, not just the physical one, but spiritually as well. Yeah, my heart of stone became you. <laughs> That's right. It was, wow. it was just all of a sudden, like, you know, you see and, and understand things that you didn't understand. You step across a line into the spiritual. It's really hard to explain. You know, before you ask Jesus into your heart, you just don't understand what's there. And, and all mm. of a sudden your eyes open and the world has a new colour. <laughs> and It's just, um, yeah, an amazing journey. It doesn't mean life becomes perfect. <laughs> we know that. Christians yeah. all know that. But even through the trials and journey of life, just knowing that God is there and he's real and he's mm. love and he's powerful is so incredible. So it's been an incredible journey, yeah. Now you were healed, but you still had some problems with your kidneys. Is that right? Yeah, my heart was restored miraculously, eventually to just normal, but my kidney function stayed just outside of normal. And I've stayed on one medication, pretty much the same dose for all of these years. So I was left with a thorn in my side. There's consequences for the choices we make. Mm. And these days, I actually, after being asked by a teacher, (laughs) I've actually been doing 10 years of drug and alcohol Mm -hmm. awareness education, using my story and lots of other information. And it's not, you know, missed by the students, the fact that there's consequences. The Mm -hmm. the fact that I've been left with consequences is a good lesson for all people (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask you, what if somebody said, well, hey, you know, you became a Christian, God healed your heart. Why didn't he heal your kidneys? What would you say? Well, I'll tell you one of the reasons early on in particular, um, I was really tempted to get back into drugs. You know, Mm. when I first became a Christian, I said, God, if you could heal my heart in that first week, why didn't you heal my kidneys in that first week? And the answer was instant. I would have got back into drugs. If I'd Mm. only been, no matter how ill I was, if I'd only been ill for one week, people all around me were still using drugs, my partner and lots of friends. I was in that scene still. It would have been so easy. And, Mm -hmm. in fact, even after all I'd been through, I was tempted several times before I had children and before I chose Jesus, of course. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the temptation was there. The enemy is there tempting you. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I I knew what the feeling was like to use these drugs. So, but it was the fear of what could go wrong. The fact that I was left with damaged kidneys, I knew this could kill me. And, you know, I even had one time when I asked someone to give me some heroin and they left a little amount, probably a very small amount, on a ledge for me. And I walked past it 10 or 20 times, Mm. desperately torn between the desire to, to use it and have that feeling and the fear of what could go wrong and the fear won. So I can see God's hand all over, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, the way that he's He's healed me and left a thorn in my side, yeah. yeah. Now, you were a new person, a new creation when you accepted Jesus as your Savior. What about your relationship with your boyfriend at that time who was a drug user? <laughs> Yeah, well, we went on and continued. We married before I was, well, when I was pregnant with my first child. And, mm-hmm. and he, he's he's a good man. He's not a bad man. He's intelligent. But, you know, I got into drugs, you know, out of just naivety and being thinking it was a bit of fun, whereas he'd been through more of a trauma as a child. And this he didn't nearly die like me. So he continued to use drugs over many years on and mm-hmm. off. He went through stages where he did really well. He worked hard. He got off the drugs. But... It was a painkiller for him. And when when he was hurt for whatever reason, you know, he turned back to this. And mm. So it's a real battle. I absolutely. mean, even though in your head you might know this is a bad path, this is not good for me, that temptation yeah. is very strong. I mean, he battled with it for several years. Is that right? Oh, many years, 26 years after me, on and off. While you were together. Is that right? Yep. Yep. And like, you know, as a Christian, I believed in marriage. He was a good father. He loved his kids. It was like a ball and chain that he carried. Mm. Um, Look, eventually, 
this brought our marriage to an end. Mm. And looking back, I believe that I was kind of enabling him. <laughs> um, I didn't look at it that way at the time. And he's actually found Jesus, uh, turned back to Jesus. He did early on and then mm -hmm. sort of still struggled. But he's turned his life around completely. And, and I think both of us hit the bottom before mm -hmm. we turned our life around, you know, and sadly that's often the way with drugs. So, yeah. But, yeah, you know, God has been gracious to both of us despite all of this, yeah. Now you wrote about your experiences, basically what you've been sharing with us in a book. Yep. And your husband read that book? Yeah, yeah. Well, I've actually written two books now, but the first book, Out of the Darkness, he contacted me about a year after I published it and said to me, I was never going to read that book because, you know, he, he knew all the, all the stories or we thought he did, he, but he said to me, I think God's anointed that. Mm -hmm. And within a few weeks, he was off all of these addictive things that he was on, including cigarettes and... and Fantastic. Um, yeah, yeah, methadone, <laughs> Oxycontin, heroin, you know, like he was totally set free. And and mm. this story, um, little story, has impacted many lives. And, of course, you know, you give so many away and people pass them around and I have no idea how God's using that. But I do know I spoke in a uh, – share my story in a church in Adelaide um, a few years back and mm. I got a – an email back saying that two people bought books for relatives who were battling addiction and both of those people went into rehab after reading the book. I've also been contacted by um, lots of parents of uh, young people using drugs and I've helped a few people into rehab and out of drugs. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's really tough. And, and mm -hmm. we, let me tell you, with methamphetamine, it is so addictive and it mm -hmm. rewires the brain to a level that it's really hard to get people off that drug and into rehab, but it is possible. There's always hope. Yeah. You're listening to The Story. Our guest today is once again Karen Redpath, who's the author of the book Out of the Darkness, about her story of coming out of the darkness of drug addiction. We'll hear more of Karen's story and how God's been working in her life when we return. The Story. If this program has highlighted something you'd like prayer for, we'd love to pray for you. Call 1-800-PRAY-FOR-ME. That's 1-800-772-936. It's a free call. Or text 0401 132 888. Hi, I'm Jimmy Colfax and this is The Story. We're back with more of Karen Redpath sharing her life journey and how God led her out of the darkness of drug addiction. Before the break, we heard how she became a Christian and how she went on to write a book about her experiences called Out of the Darkness. Next, we'll hear how she becomes a drug and alcohol awareness educator as she continues her chat with Eric Scatterbo. So today you are now a drug and alcohol awareness educator going into schools yep. and churches, sharing your story and information about drug addiction. How did that come about? How did you go from recovering to educating people? Well, let me tell you, I, I would probably be one of the most terrified persons at people of uh, public speaking <laughs> ever. Uh, yeah. I know a lot of people are, but for me, I'd had a heart failure. And when I was speaking to anyone public, even in a group of six people at a home group, you know, my heart would pound so loudly that I think I was going to die. <laughs> uh, you know, this voice in my head would say, you're going to die now. <laughs> but one day a, a teacher contacted me. He'd read my book and he contacted me and asked me to speak to the uh, some of the senior students at the school where he's spoken I was terrified but I wake up one morning and realize this is not about me mm. you know God's brought me out of this I've got a message here I've got a story and I'd also worked part-time in a school for, as an integration aid um, or mm. curriculum support so I had a real rapport with young people I'd mm. raised children you know so yeah. I yeah. did this and I had such a great rapport with the young people that I started to do this more often and I've now been doing drug and alcohol awareness education in schools and businesses and mining company uh, around Australia over the past 10 10 years it's a tough journey <laughs> but for everyone who says no um it, it really is worth it yeah and, and it's not just stories like 
I talk about the brain and risk taking and, mm -hmm. you know, the latest scientific evidence uh, on marijuana and vaping is massive at the moment. Mm -hmm. I even touch on the environmental impact of illicit drug making, you know, what to do oh, in an okay. emergency. I do mm -hmm. talk about ice. Um, but I also talk about, like, for instance, there's a scripture in Proverbs 29, 18 that says, my people without a vision perish. I talk about the need to have you know, a hope and a dream and, and plans for the future, you know, I... Because that was kind of your story. Yeah, yeah. I, I went to school, I got a job, and I partied. I had no plan for the future, and I nearly perished. Mm. And it's so important, and plans can change along the way, that's okay, but mm -hmm. to have some sort of goal or plan and hobbies, get in, involved with groups and people and young people, youth groups, if you can... Uh, all of that, hang around people, you know, plan for the future. Think about <laughs> where you're going to be in 10 years' time, mm -hmm. in 20 years' time. You know, think ahead. I didn't do any of that at all. And it's yeah, so, so important. Yeah. If you're just kind of floundering in life or, you know, aimless, and yeah. somebody says, hey, let's have a good time, let's do some drugs. Well, you're yeah. going to be more susceptible to try that because you don't really have a goal that you're aiming for that you'd say, no, no, I can't do that because I'm I'm busy going to university yeah. or whatever your vision is. Yeah. So yeah. that kind of floundering or aimlessness can make you susceptible to a temporary high. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. like from the point of view of a Christian, you know, John 10.10, 10, the thief or Satan comes only to steal mm -hmm. and kill and destroy. Mm -hmm. And I, th I believe one of his key tools is drugs and alcohol. And he's the tempter who, who lures people into that way. But then, of course, don't forget Jesus then says, <laughs> but I have come that you may have mm -hmm. life and life to the full. So, yeah, look, there's so many scriptures warning about, you know, in Ephesians 5.18, don't be drunk with wine. It will ruin your life. Mm. Um, first Peter 5.8, be sober and alert your enemy. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. You know, there's there's um, scriptures about pharmacia and the dangers of drugs, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that also links drugs to sorcery. That's in Galatians and, and Revelation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's so hard for young people to, to say no, but we, and with so many drugs and there's people out there also trying to push and normalise them as yeah. what's wrong with it, you know? Yeah. And yet our rehabs are full to overflowing, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. 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 And the irony is, is that a lot of young people think the abundant life, the full life is partying and all that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. But it's kind yeah. of a fool's gold, if you will, yeah. because it's not, Absolutely. as we heard in your story, you're a perfect example of, no, what you thought was the fulfilling fun life is not fulfilling and leads to a path into darkness. But yeah. thankfully, you've come out of the darkness, which is the name of your book. And I forgot yeah. to ask you, why did you write your book in the first place? Um, look, I believe that was God put it in my head. I just had these stories in my head that I you know, couldn't sort of let go of. And um, I couldn't do it while my husband was battling addiction in the house and the moment he left. And let me tell you, it's all forgiven. He's a good man. Mm -hmm. You know, he'd been through some trauma and, and you know, unfortunately that was his way of, of dealing with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and as I said, he went through stages where he worked hard and went really well and loved his kids. But the moment he left, I just it just poured out of me. Now, it's really easy for anyone to read, but I've had amazing responses to it. Um, I, I might just say also... When I speak in schools, I, for young, but for any young people who've been through any sort of trauma, I direct them onto um, help services rather than self medicating because this is the issue that so many people hooked on drugs and, and, and alcohol have is that they've been through a trauma, they don't know how to deal with it, mm -hmm. and they try to drown it out, you know, block out the pain mm -hmm. with drugs and alcohol. And it might be a temporary fix, but long term, it's, it, it's just disastrous. Mm -hmm. Like I said, just a moment ago, our, our rehabs are just full to over brimming with long waiting lists of people trying to get in to mm. get off drugs and, and, and sort their life out again. Yeah. So there is lots of help available. Yeah. So ideally, don't go down that path in the first place is what you're saying. <laughs> Oh, that's what I would say. The world's trying to push otherwise, but absolutely, it's a very, very dark, even for people who think it's okay. <laughs> and they think they, like you think you, I thought I was in control. Look what happened to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Now, you mentioned a number of Bible verses that played a role in your life. Can you share with us yep. some more? Oh, look, there's, uh, let me think of this one. In it, when, I was, when I became a Christian, in, in 2 Peter 3.9, it says, it is not God's will that any should perish 
but that all should come to repentance. Like it's not his will for people mm-hmm. to perish. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've got a really uh, powerful one that, that that I sometimes sign off in my book because I love it. In um, Psalm 118, 17, it reads, I will not die but will live and proclaim what the Lord has done. And that's what I find, you know, my book storing and what sharing in particularly. I can't share the whole um, Christian side, obviously, when I speak in secular schools or businesses, mm-hmm. but in Christian colleges and, and um businesses I do and I might say I've got a I've got a real um a feeling of urgency to speak more commonly more often in Christian colleges because it's Christian parents who are coming to me with young children or teenagers who've Mm -hmm. grown up in the church gone to Christian colleges and they've you know, left school and and hit the big wide world and they've discovered drugs and, and there's a lot of young Christians who, of course, the enemy hates Christians more than mm. anyone, so yeah, yeah. Uh, they're tempted down that path. And it's, um, yeah, so I really want to get in because my message is is about demand reduction. It's about reducing demand, about prevention. You know, that that's what I'm, my aim is and my story uh, certainly, I know it impacts, you know, from the feedback that I get from young people, I know that it impacts people, yeah. So, obviously, when you go into schools and churches and share, you share your story, but you share yep. more than your story. In the few remaining moments that we have, can you share with us some of the truths that you would like all young people or all people in general to know about drug addiction? Oh, look, it's painted these days, as I said, in in a way that, oh, it's really common, everybody does it, Mm. Um, but it actually is really reaching into the dark side. It's it's from a spiritual level, there's a dark spiritual side to drugs. If anyone reads either of my books, Out of the Darkness or Chasing After the Wind, which is the more secular version with biblical um, principles in there, um, there's a story in there about one of the really dark times I had where I saw this horrible, frightening creature while I was, you know, high on hallucinogenic drugs and mm. other things as well. Mm. And and my, my housemate in the next room had this similar thing happen. There was a dark presence over mm. the house. It's quite freaky. And from the outside, you can look back and see that. But in the middle of it all, you get blinded to it and you can't see. You, you're fooled by the, the tempter, you know. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah, and so many people have some sort, like even just what it puts families through. You know, I was mm. mentioning earlier that, you know, grand, there's grandparents across this country who have grandparents groups raising their grandchildren because their own children are hooked on drugs and alcohol, mm. particularly ice at the moment. Mm. That's a yeah. shocking drug that's causing so many problems. It's caused, you know, the... The accident we had uh, in Melbourne, four police officers were killed in one accident. They pulled over a guy in a Porsche who was speeding and they were standing next to his car and a truck veered across the traffic and smashed into the car and killed all four police officers, the biggest Mm. single death incident of police officers in Victoria ever. Mm. And both of them were on drugs, the guy Mm. in the Porsche and the guy in in the the truck. You know, Mm. this is the problem. It's on the roads. It's, Mm. um, you know, the Burke Street Massacre. He was an ICE user um, named James Gargasol. It's, you know, this is the reality of drugs. People think they can control it and do it, but you just never know when Mm. it's going to turn bad. And it doesn't mean there's no hope. People can get out of drugs. People can turn away from Mm -hmm. this. You know, I'm not saying it's all hopeless. Yeah. Well, obviously, your story is a story of hope that your life can turn around. Absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. And also your husband, your ex-husband. Yeah, ex-husband. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we still communicate well, you know. Mm -hmm. We've got three children together and it's it's all cool, but... Yeah, it's, it's, we both uh, are really have been blessed. And the, the key to that was Jesus. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So a long journey out of the darkness into the light. Thank you so much yeah. for sharing your story and your wisdom with us today, Karen Redpath. And my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, that was part two of Eric Scatterbo's conversation with drug and alcohol awareness educator, Karen Redpath, who's the author of two books, Out of the Darkness and Chasing After the Wind. To find out more about Karen Redpath and her story, you can go to her website, karenredpath.com.au. Remembering Karen is spelled K-E-R-R-Y-N, redpath.com.au. Also, Karen is on the board of Drug Free Australia, and if you would like more information on drug abuse prevention in general, their website is drugfree.org.au. Once again, that's drugfree.org.au. 
Finally, we heard that Karen's whole story of drug addiction began when she was just looking for a bit of fun and her young life was somewhat aimless. She says the lesson she learned is encapsulated in the Bible verse, where there is no vision, the people perish. And that's what she's sharing with young people today. Have a goal or aim for where you want to go in life. And if you're seeking the Lord's will, you won't be tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by the wind. But if you keep your eyes on the Lord, he will help you get through any deceptions or traps that the evil one puts in your way. Karen's prayer is that no one will have to go through the darkness and pain that she's experienced, but will enjoy the abundant life by living in the light. Well, thanks for joining us for part two of Karen Redpath's story. Until next time, I'm Jimmy Colfax, encouraging you to share your story with someone today. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au. 